Every year, before we wish a happy new year, we have this wonderful festival of Christmas. And I'm sure we normally associate Christmas with the new year. And for centuries, almost 20 centuries now, Christmas has become one popular festival from one small place, probably in Jerusalem, to the whole world today. And I wonder what are the thoughts that come to your mind when you talk about Christmas? It's gifts, it's decorations, it's celebrations. Those of you who are in Goa, it's parties, it's festivals, and lots of people come here. In fact, many people tell us that Goa is different during Christmas. Perhaps it's because of the long influence we've had over 500 years of the Portuguese who lived the faith. But talking about it deeply for every Christian and for anyone in the world, I think Christmas has a very strong, deep spiritual meaning. And let me come today to reflect this with you. I know spiritual thoughts cannot be given in statements. Different people will understand them differently, but let me try and explain to you in the simple way that I can. And I hope at least something triggers in your mind about this wonderful festival. First, the very fact of Christmas is the birth of Christ amongst us. In fact, if you look up at the word Christmas, it was known as Christ's Mass. Mass is the celebration of prayer, the topmost or utmost prayer that we have as Christians. And the celebration that was done on Christmas Day was known as Christ's Mass. Toward the Middle Ages, it was called as Christian Mass, and some, somehow or the other, today it's called as Christmas. We have learned how to shorten as normally it happens in languages. And what does Christmas really mean? If you are saying Christ has been born, you're celebrating a prayer in honor of the birth of Christ, it has a very deep meaning as people of faith. I'm sure as people of faith who like God, we like to pray to God, we want to deal or interact with God. We have this image of a God higher up in the sky we pray to. For some religions, God comes in forms of avatars. They're like forms of a God. For some people, God comes in terms of a prophet who is a voice of God, who sees or he feels that, you know, God has inspired him. And so God is coming and talking to you the message that is sent from heaven. But Christmas for us has a different meaning. It's like God is born amongst us. It is said that about seven centuries before, the prophet Isaiah had said this prophecy that a virgin shall bear a son and his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And I feel this is a very strongly shaking truth for many of us. It is like saying God is not coming and speaking to you from heaven. God is here with you. It is not saying that now God is going to tell you what to do. God is now living your life. He is trying to live like how you and I have lived. And for many of us, this truth sometimes if you reflect on it is even more shocking. It is now God has not remained all powerful, almighty up in heaven. I'm sure you and I know as human beings how weak we are, how many mistakes we do, how many times we struggle with the simple things of life. And now here, God is not telling you what to do. He has become like you and me. And now he's going to do the same things in his life. And if God can do it, do it in his life, why not you and me? And so now the whole task upon us in this season or in this time of Christmas is to reflect and see if God can be like one of us, then probably we ourselves can be much more higher than the lowly beings that we sometimes imagine ourselves to be. And so the basic truth, my dear friends, is that God now doesn't speak from heaven. The intervention of God done in human history is to be born like you and me in a human flesh. And this has a lot of side effects, as we may say in our human terms. First, God doesn't come like an angel. He is born. And in our, your and my experience, where does people, where do people find themselves being born? 
in the family. And so exactly what happens is here, we celebrate the family. Perhaps we don't realize why we come together. We might say, oh no, we come and celebrate a feast and a meal because in a family we get together. But the real truth is God was born in a family. And so when we get together during Christmas as a family, that means we are giving utmost importance to what God has given the family. So our immediate family is the most important and that is where in our interaction we find God's presence. Next, when we come together as family, there is always joy and happiness, but there is grace. And grace is something that we cannot fight for. It's not that, you know, I go and say, you know, I have paid you 200 rupees, so I want something in return for this 200 rupees. That is barter system, buying. The very first words of the angel from God who came to Mary was, Hail Mary, full of grace. It means that God had already kept her in that grace and God was still giving her the freedom. And when there is grace, there is no choice. The choice is still there. It is given to you without any condition. I'm sure Mary did not choose, God decided. I did not choose what to do, but God is the one who inspired. Very often we do certain things because we choose, but at times we realize things are not very clear in our hands and yet we take the risk. And I feel these times when we take such risks are what is inspired by God. The so next message or next the value that we can really learn from this wonderful festival is the aspect of grace. Grace where God gives without even thinking, without even counting the cost. I'm sure according to our Christian literature of the Bible, in the first very book when God created Adam and Eve, even there God made them holy and God gave them freedom, but those people abused the freedom. That's what most humans do. And here God knew that probably even Mary could say no. Probably the persons involved around the birth of Christ would also refuse. And God took the risk. God formed them the same way he had formed first humanity, gave them the grace to be holy, and yet he again gave them the choice. And that's why the angel comes to Mary before the whole season of Christmas to say, you will be with child. And Mary last words in that wonderful intervention of the Annunciation, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. And so my dear friends, this aspect of grace according to me is what brings today the wonderful feeling around Christmas of giving gifts. I'm sure when you give a gift to somebody, you are going to the trouble of finding out what that person really needs. I just don't buy something that is cheap and I give it to a person. Then the whole value of the gift becomes how much did I spend for this gift I gave you? Oh, you know, that person did not give me very much, so why should I give him an expensive gift? I'm sure if God were to check on how worthy gift we were supposed to get, he wouldn't have come on this earth. But the very fact that God himself was born like one of us, it means that God did not hold back anything so that we may have the salvation and the grace that we could get. And so very often, I also ask people who want to give gifts to one another because I know Christmas is the time people like to go and gifts, give gifts. Right from the time children go for Christmas parties, no Christmas party is over without a gift. And now we made those gifts only for small children, nonetheless. But giving a gift is something that you give without counting the cost. Giving something that the person requires, not something that you don't want anymore and you just want to get rid of the things that perhaps you don't know what to do with. And so, according to me, the second wonderful aspect of this feast is the aspect of grace. The third wonderful value, spiritual value, we can draw out from this, the aspect of how God is born amongst us, is if you look at the people involved in the whole scene of Christmas. We have Mary, we have Joseph, we have Elizabeth, Zechariah, we have the angels, the shepherds. Each and every one are ordinary human beings. They aren't 
people born with royal blood. They, they aren't people who are in high families. In fact, they are so ordinary that when Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem because of the court's order or the king's order to register, they didn't even have a place to stay. And the story goes that because they didn't get any place to stay and Mary was on the verge of giving birth to a child, they took the most humblest of dwellings, a stable. And it was there where Christ was born, where the Son of God was born. And so the next wonderful lesson for us, all of us who reflect on this, this aspect of Christmas, you don't require a royalty, you don't require a lot of things, you don't require people who have achieved high goals or aspirations in life. It is God intervening in the lives of ordinary people. And this ordinariness, if you look at the challenges they faced, I'm sure many of us still face those challenges in our life. The question is, do we still take the risk and take the step ahead, thinking that, you know, what I'm doing is not my achievement. It is what God inspires us to, this, to take the steps in life with the situations I am in. And so, the step forward. What is the relevance today? I'm sure if you reflect and look at the surroundings today, it's very much the same in human history. We have kings and political powers who are very strong, who come out with rules and regulations because perhaps they feel this is how they need to govern, this is how they need to rule a particular area in their power that they have. But at the end of the day, even the power, the situations it creates, leaves us with the choice to say, are we going to bow down to an earthly path? Or are we going to listen to the voice of honesty and truth that is coming down from heaven, that we know in our hearts that this is the right move that we need to make. And so, the first reflection I would like to leave you today, trials, tribulations we have. The governments have their own power. In fact, at the time of Jesus, the Jews and the Israelites thought God would send a savior who would overthrow the Romans. What happened? He didn't even say one word to the Romans. Perhaps the Jews themselves used the Romans to kill Jesus. And we know in human history what happens, that not even three centuries down the line, the Roman Empire was totally collapsed. Christianity still stands even today. So, governments and powers will come and go. I think you and I as ordinary human beings who have deep faith, who know that God can intervene in our lives, not just like, you know, a being that comes from heaven, like an avatar or some prophet who comes and tells us what to do, these are helps. I'm not saying they are not. But what better help than the presence of God himself right before us who gives us the value and teaches us by his own example by being born amongst us. Second wonderful aspect about how it can be relevant even today. Very often now in this world where technology comes, we often use reason. When uh, we want things to move very fast, you know, I have a mobile, I, I have technology, I want things to look glamorous, I want things to work very, very quickly. And uh, looking back at my short life, I'm just cross 50. When we were small, there was a lot of superstition, a lot of faith. And traditionally in India, I used to tell my friends in Italy, you know, you have people here who have faith or who are anti-faith. You know, they're angry with people who have been in power and who have been in religious authority and you don't like what they do. And I tell them, these people who are in charge of authority will not be there forever. So are you buying, bowing down to a person or are you listening to the voice of God within you? And when it happens that you have to listen to an internal voice, that's why we call it spiritual, it is not something that comes out automatically for many people. You need to understand of how people behave or what people do and how this could be the best choice that God wants in your own life. And so the next aspect I want to bring here, at least in how it can be relevant today, the challenges today may be different. And maybe the modern world is asking us, look for a quick answer. 
I'm sure the answer will become quick to you if you are one who is imbued in the spirit constantly. You will not say to someone, I'll wait for 10 years to give an answer to you. But if for 10 years you have been in a very spiritual contact with your own God, I don't think it will take even seconds for you to decide which side of the fence you belong to. And so, right now perhaps we might not have God being born. At every Christmas, we enact the scene so that we are reminded of the very fact that God was not someone who was omnipotent. He is. But now he is someone who is humble like a child. And so in human history, he has taught us a message of how we can still, in spite of the situations and trials we have, can still be very faithful and trust in the providence that God gives us. And so here I want you to reflect perhaps on the situations that are happening in our own societies. There is unrest still. Look at the amount of wars that happen in the world around. Look at sometimes in our own lives, we just disrespect society and we even disrespect the environment around us. If you look at the way sometimes in your own normal habits, we don't even consider that, you know, I'm doing something which I'm maybe I eat something and throw paper out or I do something that will hurt somebody else or sometimes I spend so much in the celebration around and very next to my house you find so many people who don't even have one tenth or one hundredth of the potential I have or the facilities I have. Let us look at the situation around us with the walls, with the way we deal with environment at times, for us, it looks like I can have a celebration and spend as much money as I can and be as extravagant. And just next to my house, you'll have people who hardly have the means even to survive. And so, if we are really celebrating Christmas, the question would be, what is my gift that I'm giving to those around me? At times, it could be a change of attitude. At times, it could be personally reaching out to those who I can and I am aware of so many people who have made choices like this that as family let's spend together time which is quality time for the family and at the same time let's have something that we can do towards society to those who need our help, our assistance, our resources because probably these are the graces God has given in our hands. If I can share that same grace with somebody else you don't know how much I could change the life of those around us. And so, one of the strong relevance we have today is to be able to deeply understand, do I still believe that God has given me the grace? And do I still believe that I can be able to give the same gift and grace to those around me? Do I still believe that the birth of Christ is something that God has made a choice to come in human history. The choice is still given to me. It is not that God is telling me now this is what you have to do. I'm sure, my dear friends, that whenever I deal in life, I don't listen to somebody else and do exactly what he says. I mean, if somebody tells me and gives me a message that, you know, what I am doing is not wrong, unless and until you retrospect and introspect in your own life and say, how well can I respond? The best response would be the response that you can do with the way you think and with the resources you have. We cannot change the whole world in a day. But I'm sure the spark that you create can surely be able to generate other sparks. And I'm sure this is going to make a big sea change. Very often, I had this question that many people, when I interact, they ask, isn't Christ only for the Christians? Isn't Christ or Christmas a Christian festival? And I tell them the irony is that we all think Christ was born in the West. He was born in the East. He was born in Jerusalem, in Israel. We all think that Christ was born a Christian. Christ was born as an Israelite in a Jewish family and the Jews themselves, themselves did not accept him. And so if you look at it from the point of view of being part of a religion, of course today we have a whole tradition that is built over 2000 years. Christ was born in one community 
And that very same community didn't expect it. And in fact, they themselves did not accept him. And at the end of the day, you find people from every class, creed and culture who began to find the wonder and the beauty of what all these followers of Christ would do. And they found how their life changed societies that they said, in spite of all the persecution that these group of people had to face, we also can be like them. You look at the first two centuries in Christianity, you find that the people who became Christians were actually non-Jew. They were people who were from different walks of life, who when they heard the apostles coming and speaking in passion, they would tell them, be like Christ. In fact, the first Christians were called followers of Christ and then gradually, like how it has happened with Christmas, this follower of Christ became Christian. So let's not attach them. I'm sure what God has done in one community, the Jewish community, is one that has affected almost every community. And the moment we try to limit God to one community, I think we are trying to dictate terms to God and say, oh, this is your place. The other areas are not for you. I'm sure I can learn from any human individual. Right now, God has given me an even beautiful example by becoming a human individual. And if that is going to change the way I'm going to live, and if that is going to change the way society is going to live, and I'm sure at the end of the day, if that is what is going to change the peace, the serenity we have, and together, development we can make, I'm sure the steps I take will not be one that puts one community down, but rather that builds all communities together. In fact, that is the wonder perhaps that we have today with this wonderful birth that we commemorate again of Christmas. So, my dear friends, just to sum up the little reflection we've had. First, it is the direct intervention of God in human history to be born like you and me. No longer through visions, no longer through prophets who come and speak, no longer through avatars that perhaps came in human, in divine form and tried to impress upon us. But right now, God's intervention is a simple, humble baby, a human being like you and me. Along with that, we have the wonderful aspect of grace. Grace where God gives in abundance without counting the cost, not because I deserve it. I'm sure if you and I reflect on our life, we will not be worthy of even the little grace we get. But at the end of the day, if God has given us the graces we have in our own hands and our own capacities, I think we have a bigger responsibility to dispense of it and to be able to make that much change to those around us. And today, I'm sure it calls us to look together in union, in communion, that what we do will at least build our lives, our families and our societies. If there is something that divides us, that's surely not Christ-like. It's something that builds us close like a family and makes us realize the wonder in God that has for us, in spite of our limitations, then I think that's a wonderful intervention God can make in our lives. As just like He did the first time 2008 years ago, that we can celebrate Christmas even now with beauty, with love, and with the grace that God gives us even today. Thank you.